It is a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Joshua Austin from San Antonio, Texas. Shouldn't you really be in Austin, Texas? I, you know, then I guess I wouldn't be able to have like Austin Family Dentistry or whatever because it would probably <laughs> already be taken. <laughs> so you had to go to San Antonio just so you could get the name Austin Family Dentistry? Exactly. Hey, I'm a uh, I'm a big fan of your show, uh, AccidentalGeniusesPod.com with Mike Detola. Let, let me read your bio first. Joshua Austin, DDS, maintains a full-time restorative dentistry practice in San Antonio, Texas. He is an editorial director and columnist for Dental Economics, focusing on dental products and technology. Dr. Austin lectures around the country to study clubs and dental meetings about these topics, along with online reputation management and social media. Dr. Austin is a graduate of the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio Dental School and spent five years post-graduation as faculty in the Department of Restorative Dentistry. His approach to his Pearls for Your Practice column is a fresh approach in today's commercial-driven dental journalism. When you read a pearl, rest assured that you're getting an honest evaluation of a product which was used by Dr. Austin in clinical practice on a patient. How can you how can you specialize in online reputation management when you're doing a show with Mike Totola? I know, no kidding. <laughs> we, we've gotten ourselves into trouble a few times. So nothing that we can't talk our way out of. Oh my God, I love Totola. I, I think the most controversial uh, podcast I ever did was with uh, Aaron. Yes. Uh, and uh, what's your last name, Aaron? Uh, Elliot. Elliot, yeah. With two T's. Aaron Elliot with two T's. And uh, when I uh, told Detola that it's uh, on the message board, it's real controversial. He just started laughing. It was like it was like he hit the bullseye. He's like, right on, right on. Uh, he's, he's so fun to work with. It's so easy to work with him. He's so funny, and it's so easy just to, to follow along with the trail that he blazes, and we end up in some really cool places. And, and you put your uh, accidental genius uh, pod on the Dental Town uh, website and app which I think is so great because with 215,000 members, that'd be the spot uh, to put it on. And I'm sure that helped uh, market uh, your podcast for iTunes and all the other places. Um, so did that increase your views? Yeah, numbers numbers went up as soon as we started posting on, on Dental Town. And, and I watched your, your and listened to your pod with Mike um, from a few months ago and you suggested that we do that. And so I, the, I think the next week I started doing that and uh, it's gone really well. We get we get more listens now than we did before. So that's that's kind of the whole point. And I, and I just want to say one lesson learned. Like like um, I'm the, um, with Dental Town, obviously, magazine. You're with Dental Economics. We have different podcasts. And a lot of times uh, people say, well, why do you do that? It's like, well, let, let me tell you why I do that, because we're all in the same fraternity. We're all in the same boat. And when I got out of school 30 years ago, I remember half the dentists were mad that I opened up in Phoenix and, and didn't want another dentist and thought in fear and scarcity. And the other half were like, man, let's go have a beer. Let's go watch the game, you know. And now watching those two different mindsets for 30 years, the ones that thought in fear and scarcity, they never got it going and I thought they were miserable. And the and the ones that didn't think in fear and scarcity, thought in hope, growth and abundancy, they had the most fun. And and it's the dentist up the street for me that I uh, that think in openness that have sent me awesome patients. Uh, uh, you know, someone will come in, I'm just like, I, I'm not jiving with this person. I'll say, well, why don't you go down the street? And what's also funny is we, is we do second opinions on people. I had a lady the other day right. came in with a second opinion, and I'm like, dude, if I was gonna have an implant done, it'd be that guy. Go back to your car and drive back there. So sure. yeah, so um, dental economics, uh, that was with uh, their kingpin used to be Joe Blaze. Right. And I mean, he every time he came to town, we would uh, do something. So so what? So tell us your journey. Um, how, how did you meet Mike the Mandatola? I, I assume it was uh, in a uh, what an Iron Man? <laughs> no, yeah, no, no, no. I, I will leave the Iron Man. You passed him on the bicycle, and you no, said, "Wait, was no. that guy a dentist?" He's, <laughs> despite the fact that he's a couple of decades older than me, uh, he, he could probably out endurance athlete me uh, any day of the week. <laughs> um, for for a period of time last year, he had a column. Uh, in dental economics that was right after mine uh, in the, the table of contents. And so through Cl uh, Chris Salerno, the editor-in-chief of dental economics, uh, I got to know Mike and, and I could tell really quickly after we met that we had a chemistry together. Uh, and so, you know, I said, hey, we need to we need to leverage this chemistry together. We, you know, we work and we need to be doing something together. And a podcast seemed like a natural fit with us being on, on other parts of the country. Him being in, uh, where, where is he at in Southern Cal? Is he's he in Newport down, Beach. 
He's at Newport Beach? Yep. Is that where he lives too? Yeah, it lives in Newport right off uh, PCH, the Pacific Coast Highway. So about a block and a half away from the ocean. That's that crazy. was the most fun I ever did. I, I uh, bought an RV and drove uh, my four boys from Phoenix to uh, uh, that highway and drove it all the way to Canada. Yeah, that's that's a great that's a great time. It was a yeah. Great time yeah, it was an, it was an amazing time. So so what how uh, what kind of penetration do you think podcasts have? I mean, it actually came out in two thousand eight. But from what I've read is that um, when the smartphone came out, when the iPhone came out, podcast came out, and they started to explode. But then Facebook put their app on the phone, and sure. and then Twitter and Pinterest and LinkedIn, and and so there's a it was a crowded space. But now podcasts are having a, a massive rebirth. What what how how um, prevalent are they in dentistry? Do you think? You know, I, I think it's a, it's a relatively small niche right now of, of dentists who consume podcasts. Um, we have a fair number of, of listeners who are students, uh, and so I think probably skews that way a little bit. But I'm always stunned when I'm uh, when I'm lecturing or, or at a meeting, and someone comes up and says they're a listener and they're you know 58 years old or whatever. Um, so it, you know, I, I hey, think go easy. I'm 53, dude. Go <laughs> easy on me. Almost there. Uh, you know it. it it's growing, it's getting bigger. Um, and, and, you know, you, having a smartphone in your pocket to have all of this content on demand, you know, is, is, is really what's driving it all. Um, you know, Alan Mead from the Dental Hacks, obviously, I think you've right, been right. years. Um, he tells a funny story. He was at a podcaster's conference last year and somebody made a snarky joke um, about they wanted to thank Serial for inventing podcasting. And obviously, Serial was a program that came out last year by. And, uh, and, and was probably the most widely downloaded podcast and kind of nabbed the pop culture headlines for a while. And I think that sort of put it in the public consciousness. Uh, and, and so I'm sure that Serial kind of generated a bunch of dentists who came to podcasts look, you know, listening to Serial. And then after they finished Serial, they needed something to listen to. And so I think that's when they found your podcast and the dental hacks and, you know, may, maybe stumbled upon the geniuses. Serial as in Serial Killer or Serial as in Breakfast Sweeties? Well, yeah, so it's it's spelled like serial killer, but it's a, you know, serial was a story that was told over 14 weeks um, and very well produced. And it was about a, like a, a murder case that had happened, you know, back in the late 90s. Uh, they just did a, a season two, actually, that was about uh, the the uh, soldier in Afghanistan that, that abandoned his post and then got picked up by the Taliban and was a uh, hostage with the Taliban for five years. And so it was his story. So. Um, it's just a, a story kind of told every week and it just kind of grabbed the public consciousness and became a big thing and you you know you see a bunch of stuff on social media about it and so serial was kind of the first really popular podcast um, and it got people who would have never listened to podcasts listening to podcasts and so I think that's why over the last 18 months or so you've seen you've kind of an explosion of, of, of podcasts so I, I could tell you a story about um launching dental town in 98 uh how, how old were you in 1998 when i launched i'm just trying to see how depressed i, I should be right now 19 years old i was uh, probably a sophomore in college oh my god and uh so when i wanted to launch dental town um this i know this is inappropriate to say but it, it's a true story it was it was, it was it was in 1998 and every when i would call up programming places to to build my website um, I was looking at their fees online. They said, oh, forget the fees, forget the fees, I'll, I'll cut it up. They were all begging because at that time, their only clients were porn and wow. they so desperately wanted to have a non-porn yeah. site to put so on their portfolio. Sure. And they go, we're some of the best programmers in Phoenix, but when any Fortune 500 calls us up, they say, well, give us a list of your sites. We're like, <laughs> So everybody was breaking down their door to do a non-porn site. So I, I had the cat's meow picking of someone and they just wanted it for their portfolio. That's awesome. And, and they were, uh, they had my site on their portfolio the minute it had a splash page. You know what I mean? Because it was about the only thing they had. So, um, so talk about how did you, uh, tell us your journey. How did you hook up with dental economics and pearls for your practice column and uh, product navigator newsletter? Talk about that part yeah. of your journey. So I, you know, I've known Chris Salerno, who's now the, the chief editor of dental economics for probably eight or nine years. We met at an ADA new dentist conference in Portland, Oregon, like back in the mid 2000s. How do you and spell just, his last name? Uh, Chris Salerno, C, uh, I'm sorry, S-A-L-I-E-R-N-O. Um, and he's now the chief editor of dental economics, has been for um, a young guy from uh, Long Island, New York. Um, 
you took over for Joe, Joe Blaze. Right. And um, so I've, we've I've met him several times. We, we've yeah. we've been like we, we've been lecturing uh, in rooms next to each other many times. Yeah, he's he's great. He's he's really good. We've we've been kind of good friends over the past eight or nine years, and and so he called me um, two and a half years ago or so and said, "Hey, I got big news. They offered me uh, the the chief editor job at Dental Economics." Um, and, and I'm going to continue to practice a couple of days a week. Would you be willing to write pearls? Uh, and you know, I had, I had known about pearls for your practice. I'd read pearls for your practice and, you know, that was Joe Blaise's thing. And, and so I, you know, I said, absolutely. Uh, and, and so, you know, that kind of started two and a half years ago is innocently enough with that phone call and, and been doing it ever since. And it's, it's really fun to, to develop relationships with these different companies and get a chance to play with new stuff and, and, uh, you know, it, it just really is cool to be able to um, to work on on you know patients with with the newest stuff and see what's good and what's not and talk so, to the so about so it. you're really Jimmy Fallon. I mean, you inherited the Tonight Show. Exactly. Pretty pretty much because you kept the name the same, right? Yeah, Pearl's here practice. It's still and, the same. And you uh you look like Jimmy Fallon. So okay. uh. I don't know. Is that good or is that bad? Well, you got better hair than it. no. He, you're both adorable. The, you guys are both extremely adorable. Um, um, I would say you look like David Letterman a little bit now that, that now that he's retired. I saw I saw a picture of David Letterman uh, with like a, you got the shaved head and 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 all that, it, trying to go incognito. Well, my uh, my air conditioner repairman came here this morning, and the first thing he said to me is, uh, "I don't know if you look you look either between uh, Mr. Clean and the guy on Breaking Bad." Oh, like, oh, I would take that. Yeah, you grow, grow a goatee, and then you'll you'll look like Walter White. Walter White. Yeah, yeah. So, so, um, so, give us, give us the uh, the greatest hits of your pearls. What 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 pearls uh, uh, do you like, and uh, what columns yeah. should they go back and read? So, you know, over the last I don't know eighteen months or so, kind of since I started doing the column, there's been sort of three overarching I've seen amongst dental products. Uh, number one would be universal adhesives. So you know every company kind of has their their version of a universal adhesive, whether that be All Bond Universal, Scotch Bond Universal, Futura Bond U, anything with the word universal in it um, would, would count in, in that in that uh, in that scope. And that it really talks about you can etch any way you want to etch when you use one of those bonding agents. You can total etch if you want to total etch and etch dentin and enamel. You can self etch with just the bonding agent itself. Uh, or you can selectively etch, which would be etch the enamel, don't etch the dentin, let the gen gentler etch that's in the self-etch universal adhesive etch the dentin. And, and, and we find long-term bonds that are much stronger to dentin when we don't etch it. So universal adhesives are a big one. Um, a, another thing uh, that, that's come out is bioactive materials. So materials that uh, force the tooth or stimulate the tooth to form some sort of reparative material. So one of those would be, for instance, a, a cement called Ceramir made by Doxa, which is one of my favorite uh, cements. And it's a bioactive cement. And they actually have some research now that shows um, that hydroxyapatite will form at an open margin with that cement and will actually fill in the marginal gap uh, over the span of, of months to years. So we're talking about actually triggering the tooth to now respond to the insult that we've put upon it, that decays put upon it, that a fracture's put upon it, and try to heal itself a little bit. So bioactive materials, we're gonna start seeing more bioactive composites, see more bioactive cements, bioactive liners, things like that. Um, those are gonna become a, a, a bigger thing over the next few years. Um, and then the third thing is something you can't open a dental magazine, either yours or Dental Economics or whoever's, Jerry Kugels or, or, or Damon Adams, um, without seeing bulk fill posterior composite. I mean, that stuff's everywhere. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's, it's obviously, you know, taken a big part of the market. People are using it. Uh, and, and I think it's a good material. I think it's a great idea. There's some caveats about using it, some, some shortfalls here and there, or some things that, that you need to be cognizant of. Um, but I, I think all in all, you know, that's, that's a, a area that, that we needed to find something uh, to help us out because you know, as you know, composites in the posterior sometimes, you know, they just don't fare as well generally as, as they do in other spots uh, or versus, you know, amalgam or, or, or gold or whatever it may be. So um, what, what what do you think is the state of amalgam? So I'm old enough to be your dad if I'm 53 <laughs> and you're 36. Um, um, I'm, I don't care what anybody says, amalgam lasts twice as long Absolutely. as composite and it's half the cost. Um, is, is I, I'm a generation next year born in 63. 
Uh, the gener are you a generation Nexter or a millennial? I'm I'm at the very tail end of Gen X. So is do the, is the is amalgam dead with Gen X dentists in the United States? Yeah, I, it's still being taught in dental schools. So as long as it it's is still taught in dental it's, schools, you know, for for the most part, at least you know, especially the dental schools where I talk to students from, you know, that that's sort of what they're learning on. Um, you know, and then they'll they'll do more composites in clinic or whatever, but they're learning amalgam first. It, I, I don't know if you feel the same way. Every time I do an amalgam, which isn't often, but you know, maybe a few times a month, um, I think to myself, God, I love doing this. I love carving it. I love burnishing it. Like I, it just brings back great memories of dental school and the type of anatomy that you can put in with a, with, with a, a carver and, and all that stuff. It's just fun. Um, but at the you know, patients don't like it, all that stuff. I certainly am not in the, in the camp that it's poison and all that stuff. I, I think it still has a place you know, in the tough situations, in the distal box on 18, in the buckle of number 15, something like that. You know, I, I still think there's there's a spot for it. Um, you know, but I think as soon as the EPA comes out and, and, and makes a remark, which they're expected to do in the next couple of years about all of us having, you know, amalgam filtration systems and all that kind of stuff, you know, that may be the first kind of sign that the government is, is maybe turning against it. I, I don't know. And, and I know that's more for existing amalgams than, than placing new ones in, in, in the old amalgams that we take out. But, um, you know, I, everybody I talk to still likes placing amalgams. It's just that we understand patients don't want it. Uh, and so, Girl patients don't want them. Girls. That, well, that's absolutely true. Except I'm seeing more and more male patients who act like girls. I don't know if you well, have this thing well, there. I mean, I, I don't want to make this an amalgam deal, but I mean, you know, the dentists complain about high overhead and then they go amalgam free and a barrel of any of those universal agents. If you do the math on the 50 milliliter bottle to a 50 gallon barrel of oil and oil is trading between 50 and 100 and universal bonding agents are all over one million dollars a barrel. Absolutely. And Absolutely. then and then on the boys, I just asked the boy, I just say, OK, you're going to get a shot. Now, if I put this in there with metal. You probably won't have to get another shot till you're 40. But if I put yeah. this in and make it all pretty and white and tooth colored, I'm going to give you a shot every six to seven years. And and a lot of boys will say, well, I, I don't want a shot every six years. I, I don't have to get another shot till I'm 40. I'll take it. But dentists are not off that. Um, but I, I want to go back to the universal adhesives because I know uh, I don't even know what generation we're in. I mean, there was first, second, third, fourth. I think universal adhesive is what eighth generation or yeah. Some, something crazy. Be seventh or eighth. But when I but when I talk to Dennis and say, what is the number one thing that you think about with an adhesive? They never tell me how many megapascals is. They never tell me the cost. They always talk sensitivity. Sensitivity. So yeah. so talk sensitivity and bonding agents. So at the end of the day, if you don't etch dentin, you're not going to get sensitivity. I mean, that's where sensitivity comes from: is etching dentin and then the process after that of rinsing it away and then subsequently over drying it which happens a lot so during that process is where sensitivity comes up if you stop etching dentin bad things stop happening uh, and so sensitivity is among that uh, debonding is among that uh, so so I, I think the problem really becomes with etching dentin if we stopped etching dentin we'd be better off and and you i'm sure you see it i see it i see composites that were placed 30 years ago that are still doing good now those composites are different than the composites we had today. Those are some of the first composites and they only etched enamel. You know, they put glass ion or liners over the dentin and then, uh, you know, just had relied on the enamel bond and those, those last really well. Um, so I think going back to that idea of, hey, we're not going to really harshly etch the dentin with phosphoric acid etch anymore. We're gonna let the milder self etching properties of the adhesive do it. Uh, and, and not activate the matrix metalloproteases that are in the dentin that break down the bond over time. Um, and, and, and I think it turns out better for everybody. We have less sensitivity, less uh, postoperative issues, uh, shrinkage becomes less of a problem. Sort of all the bad things that happen with composites go away when you stop etching dentin. So <clears throat> me getting out in 87 to now 30 years, um, you look at the snake of people the, the, the big demographic was the baby boomers. I mean, after World War II, there was just a lot of us made. And that was our, my 30 years was the baby boomers deciding they wanted uh, bleaching, bonding, veneers, braces, Invisalign, all that, we wrote that. Now they're going into senior citizen at 10,000 people a day. So we're seeing the explosion of uh, implants. Right. But on the other side, so all your homies coming out of school, listening to your podcast, the uh, accidentalgeniusespod.com podcast. Um, the 
Generation Nexers children's, the millennials, had an echo boom of 4.3 million babies in 2007. And then follow the money, Obamacare said, health insurance has got to cover pedo. And we're seeing an explosion of pediatric dentistry. And demographically, it should be going up. So the baby boomers are all going into implants. And yeah. then the, um, so so my question is, is uh, talk bonding agents on uh, for pediatric dentistry. So for bonding for, for primary teeth, I mean, to me, enamel is enamel, dentin's dentin. So I, I don't subscribe to the whole deal of, of doing preps differently or bonding differently to, to primary teeth than permanent teeth. I think it's all the same. I'm not a huge stainless steel crown guy. That being said, if I see a kid that's got three surfaces of decay or whatever, I'm probably gonna send him to, to a pediatric dentist to do a stainless steel crown. But for, for two surfaces of decay, one surface of decay, I think composite works great. And on posterior teeth, that's a great indication for, for bulk fill composite because you're working with time anyway. You know, you wanna get that in in, in, a small of a, in as short of a time as possible. You're talking about smaller preps, all that kind of stuff, smaller teeth. So like stacking your increments like we used to do with, with Z100 composite back in the day and you know making sure that you only touch two walls with the composite and only two millimeters thick and all that stuff. Throw that out the window with bulk fill on kids. Like all, I, I'd be, if I was a pediatric dentist, I'd be all in on bulk fill with kids. I think it's a great thing and I think it's, it's gonna work really well in their hands. Part of the drawback of bulk fill is that they're really translucent. They, they, they show through a lot of, of underlying tooth structure. So, you know, if you're talking about a, a aesthetically conscious 31 year old Scottsdale woman, and you're talking about the mesial of 12 or, or, or five, that can be an issue. But on a kid, on the posterior, you know, on, a, on an MO on K, not a big deal. That translucence isn't gonna be a problem. They're not gonna have a bunch of dark stuff under there. Anyway, it's gonna work out just fine. So bulk fill is a great thing for, for pediatric dentists to look into. When we didn't have to do anything, we referred out everything we didn't like to do. But, you know, like you said, you just flimly said, you know, I'll send it to the pediatric dentist. Do you think these kids coming out of school, if, if they got an attitude against pediatric dentistry, that you, when you look at the demographics of it, you look at the money, you have to say, yeah. uh, I, because when kids come out of school and they say, you know, I, they have high overhead and they, they don't do molar endo, they don't place implants, they don't like dentures, they don't like partials. And you're like, dude, you gotta like something that's lucrative. I mean, you can't pay your bills so, on cleaning exams and composites. Do, do you think these young kids, if they're listening to you in dental school and they say, you know, I don't like pediatric dentistry, do you think it's just gonna be so huge that you have to say, Dude, you need an attitude adjustment. I don't care if you got to go to a therapist. You need to like pedi pediatric dentistry. I mean, you, so, you, you, why why do you not do chromosomal crowns? I mean, I, I have a four year old granddaughter. I I I'd want you to do a chromosomal crown error. I mean, so I, I'm the first one to make fun of pediatric dentists, and and <laughs> and I will say blatantly to all my pediatric dentist friends, joking for sure. I will say like, what's the matter? Was the chamfer too hard for you that you had to go to pediatric <laughs> dentistry? Um, and it's it's funny to me, I had a pediatric dentist call me and talk to me about, uh, they have these prefab uh, zirconia crowns now, uh, you know, for-, for new, new core? Yeah, New Smile is one of them. New There's Smiles. Different ones. Uh, and so, you know, those are for aesthetically uh, conscious uh, Scottsdale uh, housewives for their kids. You keep saying Scottsdale. That's a that's because that's in my backyard. <laughs> no, that's right. That's why I keep saying that. If I was talking to Chidol, I would say Newport Beach, <laughs> or, or, or uh, Costa Mesa housewives. But she called me and she was complaining because, uh, and this is exactly how she said it. She's like, "You have to actually like prepare the tooth." I was like, "Oh my God, my mind is blown." Like, yeah, you actually have to put a burr to a tooth. I'm sorry that like you've come to this realization. You know, I mean, yes, can pediatric dentistry be lucrative? Absolutely, it can. Uh, I, you know, I think it depends on where you're at in your practice. If you just started your practice, you need to see everybody you can and try to keep as much as you can in-house. It's not going to blow up on you. So if you can do some stainless steel crowns and all that kind of stuff, that's fine. But when your practice gets to the point where you could be filling that chair with crown and bridge or inlays, onlays, implant restorations, whatever, I think then it's an appropriate time to start saying, you know what, hey, let's let the, the specialist handle this, whether that be molar endo or whether that be pedo or, or whatever. I personally, I don't love dentures. It's not my thing. If I don't have implants to, to, to lock them into, I generally refer them out. Um, but that's because I've got stuff, you know, I've got enough kind of depth of, of patient base that I can fill that time with uh, you know, crown and bridge or whatever, you know, uh, and, and so that to me is, is a more enjoyable experience. That's just my opinion. 
Yeah, the thing about the pediatric dentistry, though, is, you know, you talk about a molar endo for a thousand bucks. The, the one thing the pediatric dentists do, you know, they're dealing with that little kid's mind. So, God dang, they go in there and they do it all in 10 minutes. They're doing like a thousand dollars in like 10, 15 minutes because, you know, they, they got this kid that they're dealing with. Um, I, I, um, last, uh, no, the same question last, uh, glass onomer for the generation nexters, for the millennials. Is that, is that, is that still alive? I actually think we're about to see a revitalization of glass ionomer. So th there have been some, some new developments in glass ionomer and it's, it's not, you know, it's certainly nothing sexy. If, if that was the cover story on Dental Town magazine next month, you know, the new <laughs> glass ionomer, whatever, I don't know, I'm not sure anybody would get real excited about reading it, but there are some great new glass ionomers. One of them is called Equia by GC. I mean, GC is kind of a company that, that everybody knows for their glass ionomers, um, you know, with Fuji 2 and Fuji 9 and all that. Equia is a really great product and they actually have, you know, seven uh, year post-op studies on glass ionomer for class twos in adults. Um, and at like seven years, they're holding up really well. So when you start getting into like seven to 10 year longevity on a glass ionomer, now that's, to me, that's actually a reasonable competitor to composite without some of the, the drawbacks of composite. I never have anybody who has sensitivity after a glass ionomer restoration. Um, and in fact, when I have somebody that comes in with a hot tooth from, you know, that let's say they had a, a restoration either placed by me or placed by somebody else that's super sensitive, one of my strategies is let me take it out and put a glass ionomer in it and it always calms down. So I think it, as these glass ionomers get stronger and get more able to deal with uh, occlusal forces, I think you're going to start seeing more glass ionomers become a thing. Uh, they're they're not you know they're pretty easy to work with. You don't you know it's sort of like the best of both worlds. You don't have to deal with sort of the voids and all that kind of stuff that you do with composite. You can't really pack it in like amalgam, but but you know you can you can sort of manipulate it really well. Uh, you don't have to worry about sensitivity. You don't have to worry about a bond as much. Uh, and, and, and if they hold up for seven or eight years. Now we're talking. Now, now I have an option. Now I have something I can do, you know, in, in a tooth that's been sensitive, you know, or a, or, or a place that's hard to get. So I, I think you're going to see a, a revitalization of glass ionomers. And they should have more money now because they had, they moved their headquarters from Japan to uh, where was it Switzerland? Yeah, I saw that. That's 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 interesting. It's always you know the Japanese have always been. Uh, I remember my dental school professors somewhat talking poorly about Japanese dentistry like oh you know all they do is they don't etch dent and this they love glass ionomer and and looking back on it I was like yeah those are all kind of good things like we we should have been doing that the 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 thing i love the most about um the internet is you got to see how all 7 billion people look at the same thing building a door a window a toilet you know and how they all do things differently and i've always been keenly aware of that the uh, the australians and the New Zealanders, they love glass onomer. And you go down there and it's like, they got, you know, I, I still think Sydney, if, if that's not the greatest civilization ever built, and they built it with convicts. Boy, that, that's, a, that's a good way to piss off okay. all your dental friends in Australia. Is when, okay. when, when you meet a dentist say, uh, um, so exactly what did your great grandfather do that got sent here? <laughs> yeah. but, uh, and then you, get, then you get the lecture that it was only 20% of. But the bottom line is uh, uh, Sydney, Australia, uh, my, my brother just moved there two years ago. It's the greatest, city on earth and you go meet those homies down there they love glass armor i'm like you guys like it so much and gc is such an amazing company there's got to be more to that story so i want to ask you a historical would uh, when you were talking about bioactive materials would would um calcium hydroxide would, would dical would that was that the first bioactive material i mean yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. When you talk to endodontists today, they almost dismissed out of hand calcium hydroxide because MTA so, has been so much better. And yeah, I mean, I think I think early on, you know, that did generate some secondary and reparative dentin lay down, you know, to be laid down. I just think we've come such a long way. It, it, the way I would equate it is is that sort of like the uh, the Model T of bioactive materials, you know, and now we're talking about a, a you know, a, a Shelby Mustang GT or something like that, you know. Uh, in how far we've come from calcium hydroxide to MTA and to, to some of these uh, amorphous calcium phosphate, you know, containing materials. So, I mean, yeah, I, guess, I guess in a way it was, um, but if you talk to, if you call an endodontist, I, I know Rick Schwartz was on your show 
um, a, a few months ago. He's an endodontist right down the highway here, probably the best endodontist in the world. Uh, if you called him and asked him about Dical or glass he'd probably just laugh and say, you know, throw, either throw that in a museum or throw it in the trash. It, it doesn't really belong in the mouth anymore. Um, and, and I would probably agree with that to a certain extent. But yeah, I mean, it probably was the first thing that kind of gave us the idea of, hey, let's try to get the dentin to generate something to, to shrink up so that so that it's not so close to a, to the insult. I thought um, the funniest thing about dentistry is uh, when they came out with that MTA, I mean, that was an endodontist looking at a swimming pool repair job. It was swimming pool porter cement right. that sat up underwater. Yeah. And that stuff costs more than a gram of heroin or, yeah, they, or they I mean, it's myth in it and it, and it all of a sudden spikes the price up about $55,000. They did what? They did what? They added bismuth uh, to, to Portland cement is, is what MTA is. They, they added bis the, the element bismuth to, to Portland cement and that's what it is. And uh, that's what you're paying for. Uh, and, and it, you know, I, I think. I don't think many people are using it for pulp capping, but if you talk to endodontists, they'll tell you that's the best pulp capping material there is. Um, but it's just, it, it, it is hard to handle. And so we're gonna find some new materials coming out. They're gonna be easier to handle than MTA, but hopefully give us the same effects. Speaking of hard to handle, it's funny when you talk to uh, 60, 70 year old dentists, um, or, or even my age where we started out, uh, I have seven gold restorations, all cemented with zinc phosphate cement. Yeah. And then we went through this whole resin cement uh, revolution. And then you got the guys at the other end saying, like Carl May saying, you know what? Any implant cement that says it's for implants is not as good as the old fashioned we started with um, zinc phosphate. And it's kind of like, I can really say that when I entered this profession, all the, all the fillings were amalgam and lasted 40 years and we ruined that. And the best cement was zinc phosphate cement, and we screwed that up. And, and maybe it. we all should have just stayed at the Flintstones Dental Center and done gold amalgam and used uh, um, um, zinc phosphate cement. I mean, I mean, look look at all the uh, implant problems when there's excess yeah, cement, yeah. periimplantitis, where if it had been zinc phosphate, it had been antibacterial, you would have seen it on a bite wing. Right. Uh, so uh, this is that no one knows how to mix zinc phosphate anymore. I know. I know. Everything comes in, a, in, a, in an auto mix syringe, and so when I ask an assistant to mix zinc phosphate, they're looking at me like they don't, they don't know. And I'm like, oh, you know, you got to cut it like cocaine. You know, you got to cut it into a bunch of different squares, <laughs> and then half that, and half that, and half that, and half that, and, and, and add it slowly on a chilled slab and all that. And they, they just stare at me blankly in the face. They have no idea. So auto mix stuff has kind of ruined dental assistants, unfortunately. And my dental assistant, uh, Jan, 30 years, she talks a lot with her hands. So when she talks, I start getting marks on my face and, you know, and uh, le leaves a bruise. So you talked about um, bioactive materials. You talked about uh, do doxa, doxa? Doxa, yeah, Ceramir. D-O-X-O or D-O-X-A? D-O-X-A. Yeah, D-O-X-A. Um, any other ones? I, I hear a lot of people talking about the company Pulp Dent. As pulp bioactive, dent, yeah. Pulp dent has some some bioactive materials. Uh, New Smile has a uh, bioactive cement, um, and so New Smile's out of out of Houston, one. right? Uh, yes, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And, and so they're they, the ones making those cosmetic uh, pediatric crowns, right? Right, absolutely. And so that's one thing about like Ceramir um, or or New Smile cement is is they actually work really well with zirconia. Uh, there's something about the the hydrophilic nature of their cement with the hydrophilicity. Of, of zirconia that works really well together and actually gives you a better bond with this sort of bioactive non-resin cement than you would get with a resin cement on zirconia. Anytime I'm putting in a zirconia restoration, it's going in with, with ceramir. Um, if I'm putting in something like an Emax, if I have enough vertical wall height where I don't need to bond it in, I'm gonna cement it with ceramir. But if I've got a short prep or whatever it may be to where I need some, some extra retention from bond strength, then I'll bond it in. Um, and so the more I can avoid bonding, the better. I mean, it's just, you know, bonding is stressful. Bonding um, is sensitive to the patient. You gotta numb them up. It's it's technique sensitive. They've had a, a temporary on for, for a week and a half and their gums are inflamed and all that stuff. So you gotta control bleeding and all that. Um, and so avoid bonding, I do. And, and Ceramir uh, helps me do that quite frequently. When you started the show, you were talking about on your uh, dental economics column, pearls for your practice, um, that there were three main things. You said, number one, universal adhesives. Then you said, number two, bioactive materials. And what was the third? Bulk fill posterior composite. Bulk fill. So let's let's uh, switch to that. Bulk fill. What yeah. what uh, 
what what uh, homies always want names. They, they don't want you know all this esoteric stuff. What 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 do you like? What, what I love names? how you say homies all the time. That's I, I, I love that. That's so good. Is that uh, right? Uh, so uh, any I mean I'll, I'll, I'll all, trade I'll trade you my homies a term for your hair. How's that? Uh, you give no, me your I, hair, and then they're your homies. If if, if both the Tola and I were had shaved heads, then uh, then I there there wouldn't be enough you know there there, there wouldn't be enough head wax uh, to go around for our podcast. Um, so anything that says bulk fill in it, obviously. Well, so, well let me let me stop you there. Is yeah. bulk fill uh, is it a is it bleeding edge or leading edge? Is any of them a buy at this point, or is it still wait to yeah. be seen? No, I mean I think I think. There's definitely a place for it in everybody's practice. If you're doing posterior composite, I think there's a place for it in your practice. Um, you just it's it's not a be all end all. It's not a perfect material, and it still has some of the same downfalls as composite has. You still have to have decent isolation. You know, you still have to, to get the curing light where it needs to be. You still have to have a really power. You actually have to have you have to make sure that your curing light is putting out full strength, and, and you get it right where it needs to get. Um, you got to use a segmental matrix if you're doing a class two. You can't use a Telfmeyer anymore uh, if you're going to bulk fill because you you won't be able to get a posterior con or an interproximal contact. Um, so that I mean the the same drawbacks exist, but I think it makes a lot of sense for most people who place posterior composites. So, uh, of the ones that I've tested, the ones I like a lot are the Tetric Evo Ceram bulk fill, um, Filtech bulk fill. Uh, now Tetric Evo's Ivoclar. Ivoclar, yeah. Well, and then what was the other one? Biltech Bulk Fill by 3M, um, and I like uh, Voco's uh, Admira Fusion. I think they call it Admira Fusion Extra, uh, and that's their bulk fill. And pretty much all of these, uh, and, and also Sonic Fill by Kerr, which has one drawback in that you got to have a uh, you got to have a space in your delivery system for an extra handpiece. And so if you don't have a space for an extra handpiece, and you're going to have to take off your handpiece and put the, the sonic fill handpiece on and then fill it up. But but all those are really good good materials. And they all cure at about five millimeters, um, which is is for the average class two on a molar, um, you know, you're looking at about between four and a half and five millimeters. So you're right in there where you could do it all in, in one increment, you know, if, if you wanted to. Um, so, I, you know, I think there's definitely a place for them. You just have to kind of understand that, that, you know, yes, you still have to keep it isolated. You know, uh, uh, yes, you, you have to make sure you get the curing light in the right spot. All that kind of stuff. All those all those things with composites still exist. It's just that you're not worrying about having to do these tiny little increments and stacking them up and getting a void in between or whatever it may be. So I think absolutely, if, if you're doing posterior composites, I think look into a bulk fill, play with different ones, see what you like, um, and, and, and you know get a sample from the company uh, and, and, and see if you like it and play with it. Because I think it's they're here to stay. They're not going anywhere. Um, and I, I honestly think we've been bulk filling for a long time. You know, when, when you think about how we were taught to do composites and, and the layers of two millimeters that, that only touch two walls and all that kind of stuff, that's fine and good when you're talking about a big restoration on a tooth that's easy to get to. But when you're talking about a small restoration, like the width of a 330 burr, that's impossible to do. We just don't have instruments big enough to do that. Or you're talking about like an MO on number 18 where you can't see. You know, how can you tell if that's only two millimeter increment? You just can't. You're just struggling to see down in the box. So I think I think bulk fill is great for all those things. We've been bulk filling for a long time. I think let's use materials. We now have materials that can tolerate it. So let's use those materials. So you also on your lectures, and by the way, if you want to have uh, Joshua lecture, go to his austindentalseminars.com. One of the things you lecture on is uh, Google and Yelp reviews. Uh, yes. And uh, that, that's how I know uh, you're old enough to be my kid because uh, um, I noticed the only people that mention Yelp are they're always uh, millennials yeah. or generation nexters. I mean, I never hear a 60-year-old dentist say, well, did you get a Yelp review? But I know it's very important Absolutely. in your generation so so I want to ask you this question um, if a Google review was the 400 pound gorilla how much would the Yelp monkey weigh I think it depends on where you practice if you're in a place like San Francisco California it may be 300 pounds or 350 pounds if you're in a place like Waxahachie Texas it <laughs> register on the scale um, so it all just where you practice. San Antonio has a pretty decent amount of, of technology companies and, and, and is a fairly kind of plugged in city. So Yelp is, is pretty big here. And, and I have, you know, I, I get new patients every day from Yelp. Uh, and so it, it's, it's been a huge plus for me. But if you're in a, a smaller, you know, more rural area, you know, it may not be that big of a deal. Um, 
but certainly more metropolitan areas, you know, your Phoenixes, your Scottsdales, your San Francisco's, your LA's, um, Austin, Texas, places like that, Yelp has been, it's just huge. I mean, it really is kind of the go-to. And people who use Yelp, like they are all in on Yelp and they believe it entirely and, and they will, uh, they, they take Yelp to heart. And so that's, that's why I found Yelp users tend to be very um, devoted to Yelp. I, now, I hear Facebook is trying to get into the, the review deal. They've got their review system. Is, is that, uh, how much would that monkey weigh? I, you know, maybe 100 pounds or so. It's, it's not nearly as good as a Google review um, because it's just not going to show up when someone searches for your name. And, and most honestly, most people are using Google when they search. Unless you're in Kirkland, Washington, and you're the only community in the country that uses Bing, you're using Google. And, and so, you know, Google obviously ranks Google reviews higher than anything else. You know, I think Facebook has a place for sure. It has a weird, somewhat of a weird thing in that you can do a rating without a review. So I could just, if I, if I were a patient of your practice, I could come in and, and rank you as one to five stars, um, but not actually say anything about my experience. Whereas the other ones really want you to sort of relay what your experience was with free form text. And so I think, I think there's some value in that. Um, I see people who have reviewed my who review my practice or have rated my practice on Facebook all the time with just a rating and not a review. And I've never seen those people in my life. I have no idea who they are or why they're why they're giving me a rating. And most of the time, it's you know four or five stars or whatever. So I'm not complaining about it. But it's interesting to me. I, I think more there there would be more uh, room for for ratings and reviews from people who don't who have never been to your practice from Facebook than there would be on Yelp and Google. Just my initial hunch. Well, what, what, what is, what's your, uh, when you're lecturing at austindentalseminars.com, when you're out there on the road lecturing, um, what do you, uh, what do you think they should know about Google and Yelp reviews? Yeah. So, you know, people always ask me a, a few different things. Number one is how do you get more reviews? And, and the answer to that is pretty simple. It's not sexy. It's, it's not a gimmick or anything like that. And it, and it kind of, you know, it's sort of like, how do you lose weight? Well, you don't eat as much and, and you, and you, you burn more calories than you take in. Right. And same kind of thing. Um, the, the way you get more reviews is you ask, you got to ask your patients. And so one thing that I, I pound into my staff all the time is never let a compliment go to waste. So when a patient gives us a compliment, whether it be they had a great time with, you know, Colleen, the hygienist today, and, and their teeth feel really clean, whatever, like that's an opportunity to ask them to leave a Google review. Um, you know, if if they say, you know, oh, the office uh, always smells so good when I come in, or oh, you know, I love the decor, whatever it is, um, you know, that's an opportunity to, to, to ask them to leave a Google review. Uh, I never ask anybody to leave a Yelp review because of how Yelp handles new reviews from people who don't have Yelp accounts, um, unless I know that they're an active Yelp user. If I know they're an active Yelp user, I'll have a conversation geared to leaving us a Yelp review, but everyone else, it's all about Google. So are you, you're in, um, you used to teach for five years at University of San, uh, Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio, and you practice San Antonio. Do you, do you still uh, um, do much with the school? A little bit. I, I used to do an adjunct lecture uh, every year, you know, a couple times a year um, to, to the different levels of dental students. Um, but you know, it's it's a great it's a great school. They just opened a new clinic facility last year, which is beautiful. Actually, uh, yesterday they auctioned off all the old chairs and delivery systems from the old school, and uh, they, there were some good deals to go around. And, and I didn't get in on any of them. I wish I would have. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I have I have a great fondness for for them in my heart. My mentor uh, is a guy named Jim Summit who wrote Fundamentals of Operative Dentistry, um, and he's still around at the school. And so, any chance I get to see him and pick his brain about about operative dentistry, I do. It's it, it's a great school, uh, and, and and I miss it greatly. I, I wish I could spend more time there, um, but a couple times a year seems to be how often I get in. So let's talk about the um, you know these kids are coming out three fifty. One of the I like talking about what's stressing them out. One of the, one of the things <laughs> stresses them out is. Uh, they come out of school, you know, 350, and now they uh, are looking at a $150,000 CAD CAM machine. They're looking at a $100,000 CBCT and a laser for a hundred thousand. What do you, uh, what, what do you think the market penetration is of CAD CAM? I, I keep hearing 12 to 14 percent of American dentists have it. Do you like that number or? Yeah, I think that's probably right. When you're talking about having a milling machine, I think we're probably in that in that 10 to 15 percent that are actually milling in their office. You know, the, the nice thing about where we're at now is with digital impressioning, we've gotten to the point now where you can be in the digital game without having, 
you know, invested $100,000 into it. I mean, 3M's True Definition Scanner runs about $15,000. Uh, makes really great scans uh, and restorations fit like a glove. You do them completely modelless with, you know, your the lab of your choice. Fits and like a glove. You mean OJ's glove? Uh, that one too. In, in, that, the, in the, the trial. Tight. You got to adjust the interproximal contacts <laughs> and put fingers on that one. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it, it it has digital impression machines have allowed us to sort of get to the point now where you can be in the game with less than a hundred grand, and I think that's only going to get only going to get better as time goes on. You know, Mike is now the, the clinical director for Serona, so I'm sure he would love for me to tell everybody they need to go out and get a CIRAC. And, and while I think you can do some really amazing dentistry with CIRAC, and, you know, guys like Tarun Agarwal and, and, uh, and the guys at CIRAC Docs right there in, in Scottsdale, and, and, and those guys all do amazing stuff. But you're right, when you have $100,000, you know, or when you have $300,000 of debt, and now you're another three hundred dollars or four hundred dollars in the hole for your practice, and now you know you're looking at spending another 120 grand on a on a CIRAC unit. That's that's a tough thing to bite off. And so I think you know, I always caution dentists who are starting practices or bought practices, wait until you've paid off your initial note uh, before you buy one of those things. I'm not as worried about student loans because that's just sort of a cost of doing business. But pay off your initial note for your startup or what you pay for the practice or whatever before you add like a CIRAC or, or a hard tissue laser or something like that. You know, this dentist uh, yesterday sent me an uh, email. We're going back and forth, but he has, it's the same email thread. And the first email thread he has for me is, uh, I think it was uh, 1994, but we're uh -huh. talking about, we're talking about CIRAC 1, okay? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I had CIRAC 1 before, you know, I mean, so all this, but I, I have to say this, it seems like a lot of uh, my friends and I that, that have the CIRAC, um, we're using it more for oral scanner, just, just from logistics, I mean, I can't prep, scan, mill, stain, glaze when I got toothaches and emergencies. And a lot of times, uh, in fact, what my buddy up uh, just right up the street from me is doing, he's just scanning them all and temporizing them. Then he has a lab lady who comes from a kind of bridge lab. She comes in every Wednesday morning and just mills out the whole okay. weeks. And it seems like every year that goes by, uh, or every, yeah, every year that goes by, I'm using the oral scanner part and send it to the lab. And I've also heard that there are some labs who will put that $15,000 scanner from uh, 3M in your office just because when you uh, scan, they're having 1% remakes. And when you right. send an impression, uh, you're that. having five. Well, Detol is the one that's telling the whole world that from, from Glideville. Well, what do, you, what do you think of that? Do you think the scan, do you think what Detol is saying is that when you scan it, you're seeing your impression real big on the screen and that's making you go back and touch it up or what, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, so I mean, I think, I think it allows you to critically, uh, you know, assess your dentistry more than you could looking at a, an impression in reverse, which is what you're looking at on it, on an impression. And that's a, we've all looked at impressions and been like, damn, that prep was good. And then you get the die back from the lab and you look at it and you're like, oh God, that doesn't look nearly as good in stone as it did, you know, in, in the negative of the impression. So I think the ability to assess stuff right then and there, you know, on a, on a, on a 24 inch monitor, that's a, that's a huge bonus. With the 3M machine, it, it you know I hit one button and it tells me if I have enough occlusal clearance. The CIRAC I think does the same thing, so it, it helps me catch problems before they even leave while the patient's still there and numb, uh, and before they have a temporary on, which is nice. Um, and and you know it, like if you see behind me over my shoulder here, that's a 3D printer I just got yesterday. Um, you know the, the day is coming where we're 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 not going to be doing allogenics really you know for anything. We're going to be doing digital scans and then you know printing whatever we need. You know, whether that be a splint or a retainer or a bleaching tray or whatever, it's all going to get printed uh, and, and, and after it's designed in software and all that. So, you know, I think the days of dentists sitting, you know, at a lab bench with diagnostic wax, with Maeve's green inlay wax, you know, <laughs> diagnostic wax, like all that stuff's gone. It's going to be sitting at a computer doing your, your you know, you've done your scan, you know, with your CIRAC, you know, and now you, you've imported that, that STL file into a software and now you're doing a digital wax up you know, with a computer and now you'll do whatever you want from there. So, I, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Like certainly having the CIRAC and using it for single unit crown and bridge is great. And that's what it's there for. And that's what's put it in so many offices. But now with the software allowing you to open up and do so much other stuff with it, do ortho stuff with it, integrate it with your, you know, with the CBCT machine that's either yours or an imaging laboratories or, or whatever, um, and to assess airways, to do orthodontic assessments 
to be able to print, you know, surgical guides to all sorts of stuff. Like having that ability to digitally create, uh, you know, scans of your patient's mouths, just open up the doors to do things that we don't even know of yet that we haven't even thought of. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that's a huge part of having one of those machines, but if you're not going to be milling single unit crowns, why, why buy a milling machine? You know, then just get a digital impression unit. Um, but you know, I think at the end of the day, when you have, when you're milling, it really needs to be kind of auxiliary driven. You need to prep and either scan or have your staff scan and then they design, maybe you check it off, maybe you don't, if they get really good at it, they mill it, they try it in, they stand and glaze it, they fire it, and then you come back in to, to do the final check in the seat. And then during that time, you're off seeing your toothaches and all that kind of other stuff, right? If you've got to sit and do all that stuff, you know, it gets, it gets really costly and, and maybe not worth you know the the boost of, of production or productivity that that they sell it as it's it's got to be staff driven okay i love your analysis now now take the next uh big expensive toy lasers i mean some some of those are 135. yeah so you know i mean I, I, it's going to get there right we're all you know 15 years from now we're you know hard tissue laser is going to be a no big deal thing we're all going to have it just like we have a handpiece um you know, when you talk about a CIRAC unit or a mill or whatever it may be, any one of the mills that there are, um, you're talking about replacing your lab fee, right? You're talking about, I'm going to, you know, spend 80 grand for this mill and now I won't have to pay my lab tech anymore. Uh, and so now I'm going to save some money on my, on my bills every month. Um, when you're talking about a laser, you're talking about using that heart tissue laser generally for composites, right? So what are the, the sort of least productive procedures in our practices? Composites, like you know, the the reimbursement rate is the lowest. The material is the most expensive, and now you're talking about tacking on a big, a big, big, big fixed cost on top of that. And so now it gets to the point where you know, geez, it's it's hard, you know, to operate with a profit. Now the laser companies will tell you, well, you don't have to anesthetize, so that's a practice builder. I would argue you could spend a hundred thousand dollars on marketing. If you if you, if marketing is a reason you're getting it, you could spend a hundred grand on marketing and get a better a better return. Um, but I get the idea of not having to use anesthetic and all that. That sounds good. Um, you know, I don't know if it's true a hundred percent of the time. The people I talk to, it's probably true three quarters of the time, and then another quarter of the time you got to anesthetize. Um, it's not going to be any faster than a handpiece. I know that for sure because I talked to a lot of people who use the laser for a few minutes and like screw this, give me a three thirty, I can get it done quicker with that. Um, so it's not faster, you know, yes, you, you don't have anesthetic, but then they talk about adding a bunch of ancillary procedures like removing fibromas and all that kind of stuff. And I think that just depends on your level of comfort with that type of stuff. If you want to do that and you see a bunch of those, I think, great, do it, you know, do biopsies and do all that kind of stuff, crown lengthening. Um, but to me, the laser is the harder sell of the two. I'd much rather have a, if I had my choice of one of those, of a machine of that type of capital investment, I'd much rather go with like a CIRAC. Uh, than I would a hard tissue laser. I love listening to you. Now do the same genius analysis on CBCT. If you're placing implants, I think it's it's a no brainer. Um, but you know, again, the problem is, and and I've talked to Mike about this. You know, so so Serona has the Galileos, right? It's one of the best uh, you know CBCT scanners, but but op, their platform is all closed off, and so you have to. It's it's almost like Apple in that. You know, you have to have a, a, an Apple computer to, to, to work with all, all the different apps and all that sort of stuff. Like it's all a close platform. Same thing with, with Serona. You know, if you want to incorporate CBCT into your into your CIRAC, uh, it's got to be a Galileos. If you want, uh, you know, to incorporate, you know, exporting your CBCT files into a, a, a uh, design software, the only place you can send it to is to CIRAC Connect. You can't, you know, send it out to 3Shape uh, or Dental Wings or any of those. So I, I think, from that perspective, I'd love to see Serona kind of open up their platform a little bit. Uh, but I think if you're placing implants, I think having a CBCT and an intraoral scanner and a 3D printer, uh, you know, you can do guided surgery really easily and uh, cost efficiently. Um, you know, and, and we're at the point now, you don't have to have an ICAT. You know, you can have a limited volume, you know, CBCT scanner that's going to cost you, you know, maybe in the 40s or 50s, as opposed to the $130,000 ICAT. So the cost of those are creeping down, which I like. Um, and so I think it makes a lot of sense if you're placing, you know, more than 10 implants, you know, in, in a quarter or a month, I think it's, it's a wise investment. What, what do you think of this argument that we often hear our homies say? They say, okay, I'll just ask you, uh, Joshua, how old is your smartphone? 
Um, yeah, my smartphone is whenever the last iPhone came out. So, you know, whatever, last September. So Okay, so would, would you want to have a five-year-old iPhone? They're, they're oh. using the analogy saying, why would you buy a $100,000 CBCT when in five years you're not going to want your iPhone and your CBCT? You're going to want the latest, greatest one. Yeah. Well, what do you say to that and, argument? You know, my answer is, okay, so so what would be the next innovation and what's going to come next that would make, you know, what's the killer feature that would make me want to, uh, you know, upgrade again? And, you know, may, maybe it's that resolution gets better or, or whatever, but I feel like resolution is pretty good right now. You know, maybe it's it's interconnectivity or whatever, and, and, and maybe that makes some sense. Um, you know, maybe it's a 3D printer or something like that built in, um, you know. Obviously, they're going to get smaller and faster. That's just the way things go. You know, I think we'll get to a point where, where you know, we're already to the point where they're about the size of a pano. You know, so it's like, well, how much smaller can they get? Panos are now about the same size now as they were 30 years ago. They haven't really gotten all that much smaller. So I think they're at the, you know, CP small enough to the point now where they're not going to get any smaller. Faster, yeah, maybe that's a reason. But I really think with a CBCT, especially if you get one from a good company who's going to continue support for it, you know, like a CareStream or or, or Serona or, or, or you know um, uh, iCat or one of those those big companies, you know, they're going to continue support. You know, if something happens, they're going to have the parts to repair it, all that kind of stuff. I, I don't see a reason to have to replace it. You don't see people replacing panos as often as they replace their smartphones um, for that that same reason. And so I think. I, I, I think intraoral scanners, maybe, you know, we be, we might be replacing more often because it seems like there tends to be more technological innovation there. But with CBCTs, I think we're, we're I think it's the only point where we're going to get maybe faster and, and a little bit cheaper to jump in, the only, the only innovations that we have from here, at least with that, you know, until the new kind of imaging comes along, whatever that may be. I, I love listening to you, man. I'm a big fan of your show. I, I want to ask you another question. And, and again, I, when I ask these questions, it's not like it's from my heart. I, I, I'm, I'm saying, quite, I get about 300 emails a day. Um, sleep apnea. Uh, yeah. A lot of, well, here, here's where it's coming from. Um, podcast interviewers, probably 20% are in dental school. So uh, 20% probably in dental school. And the other 80% are, are probably under 30, you know. But, but here's their dilemma. I come out of school. I can't do everything at once. I can't go learn how to place implants, learn Invisalign, learn sleep apnea, and then go to LVI, Dawson, Koi, Spear, and Panky all at the same time. I mean, there's not enough money and time in the day. So they're trying to, they want to do it all, but they got to slowly walk up the stairs. So my question to you first is uh, sleep apnea. Where would that be on the staircase? I mean, do you think that's bleeding edge, leading edge? Do you think that's for the physicians? It's for dentistry? Talk about sleep apnea. Now, I mean, we're the ones to diagnose it, right? We're the one, like, the sequelae of sleep apnea are so evident in a dental setting if you know what you're looking for. We've seen it for decades and decades. As long as dentistry's been around, we've seen the sequelae of sleep apnea. We just didn't know that it was sleep apnea. All the bruxism, all the wear, you know, all the, the, the protrusive type habitual movements that we see patients do, all that kind of stuff is it's all airway related. Uh, and so I, I think it's a huge part of the way I look at a patient. Um, and, and so, you know, like my mentor in sleep apnea is a guy named Jeff Rouse, um, who's a prosthodontist who practices part-time here in San, in San Antonio, part-time uh, with Greg Kinzer, uh, who actually bought Frank Spears' practice in Seattle. And then he's part-time at the Spears Center uh, doing all of the Spears Center's sleep apnea education. What's his name? Jeff Rouse, R-O-U-S. Oh, I know. I know yeah. Jeff. He's, and he's he's phenomenally brilliant. He taught me everything that I know about sleep apnea or airway issues, I, I really should say, because it's so much more broad than just sleep apnea. Um, but it's not going anywhere. We're just now starting to understand it. You, most dental students get absolutely zero sleep stuff and airway stuff in dental school. Um, so I think that's high on the, the, the pecking order of, of education you want to get. Part of, you know, most dental students come out and if they want to be a good comprehensive dentist, they try to find either a Panky or a Spear or a Coice or a Dawson, something like that. But, and that's all sort of occlusion based and, and occlusal systems and all that stuff, but you can't really talk about occlusal systems or occlusion without talking about the airway component of that. And so I think those two go hand in hand. And when looking for an education center and, and, and an occlusal system that, that you want to subscribe your beliefs to, I think looking for one that factors airway in is, is a super important thing because that education, that airway education needs to start at, 
at the the occlusion and, and occlusal system stuff starts and then and then build up from there. So I, you know, Spear is a great place to, to look at it because they've incorporated it into all their occlusion courses. Um, Dawson is starting to see, you know, as I've heard, is including it into his and and Coise obviously I think you know I think Rouse had had some relationships with there before Spear. So I, I think any of those you know are a good place to start. But if you're going to start with like some sort of occlusal, uh, you know, extra education. Uh, you got to have airway as a component to it because it is, and it's every single day in all of the patients that we see. Now, I would, um, when you said Dawson, Coy, Spear, Panky, and then you also said CR, you did not mention LVI or neuromuscular. Was okay. that intentional? Uh, I mean, because, and, and yeah. the reason I'm asking, the reason I'm asking is, is uh, not politics, philosophy, any of that <laughs> stuff. I get specific questions where these young dentists say, okay, I want to learn occlusion. And, there, and it seems like there's two different philosophies. One is CR, which would be Dawson, Coy, Spear, Panky. And then the other one is more neuromuscular and that's more the biggest brand be LVI. And, and they're trying to decide, do I go left, right? Would you would you go left CR? Would you go right neuromuscular? To, like, me, yeah. to me it's CR, but that's because that's what where my mentors are. You know, that's, you know, my mentor is like Rouse, uh, a guy named Bill Robbins, uh, a guy named Jim Summit. Th those are all my my mentors, and those are all guys who have done you know Coise and Spear and Panky and and whatnot. And, and so I just don't have a mentor who is a neuromuscular guy. And so I, I kind of honestly have sort of a hole in my uh, awareness and, and recognition of them, just because I don't understand it nearly as as much. I know that that Mike uh, Detola talks about how he went to LVI, you know, back in in the nineties. With me with you and, and actually me. it was a different day and time it was more aesthetics and veneers you know than it was where it is today at neuromuscular so honestly it's just it's it's it, i don't mean that as a slight to, to bill uh or, or any of the guys there uh I, I just don't know nearly as much about them as i do the other ones yeah i i, I personally don't think anyone could slight bill dickerson i mean he basically him him as a dentist and i declare as the company was basically the cosmetic revolution i mean if you if you if you, I mean, 10,000 dentists went through that place and, and living through that, it was two things simultaneously. It was the stock market bull run from 93 to 2000 where every American was just getting rich off doing nothing but having their house double. And Dickerson was leading that revolution and, and uh, Ivy Claire was trying to mill, make all the products in. Last question, I know you're busy. I know you're in your office. Uh, I know it's uh, an hour and two minutes. I'm over time, but one last overtime question. Sure. Um, Invisalign. Yeah. Uh, um, so, or, or clear retainer. Some, some the, the orthodontists are saying you you can't do a weekend class and do Invisalign. Some are saying, well, you can't do short term. Right? You you need to learn from a board certified orthodontist like uh, like say uh, Richard Litt in uh, San Diego. Um, so ran on that. Ran, ran on all that. Should and again specifically, this kid's saying, yeah, is this a course? These courses cost money. Is Invisalign a course to go after? Is short term ortho to go after? Or should I do the whole program or should yeah. I just refer it? I'm trying to pay off my student loans. Right. No, I, I get it. And and I to, I, I think Invisalign works really well with just like the caveat of veneers or, or whatever it may be. Case selection, right? It's just about case selection. If you're talking about a class one molar case, it's class one on both sides with you know, five or six millimeters of crowding and no more in the anterior. You know, that's a case that Invisalign can do kind of every day without much problem. You start trying to get into correcting class twos or class threes or, you know, uh, big big time arch discrepancies, arch size discrepancies or whatever, you know, it's probably not, not the right thing to do. Um, you know, and probably needs a more sophisticated treatment. My, you know, I had the ortho training that most people had, which, uh, you know, we're gonna make this as complex as possible so that you want to refer this out and only the little club like the little cool kids who are like in the top five get to learn what real orthodontics is by spending their time in the ortho clinic or whatever and so i, I never really learned much ortho i do a little bit of invisalign in my practice but that's kind of my my line is class one uh occlusion on both sides uh five to six millimeters of crowding or less and then hey we're in if not i'm sending you to an orthodontist if you really want to get into ortho and do a bunch of ortho training, like there's a bunch, you know, six months miles is great. Doing more, you know, comprehensive orthotic stuff is, is great, but you have to train your staff along with it. It's got, you can't just dabble in it a little bit. You got to devote a, a decent amount of your practice to it 
you got to spend time, you got to spend money. And so if it's something that drives you, if you like it, if you're into it, if that's what you wanted to do and, and you know, maybe just didn't have, you know, didn't happen with an ortho residency or whatever, like, yeah, go, go get all the education you want and do it. But I think Invisalign is okay in the right spot. Well, hey, um, I think the world of you, I love your uh, Accidental Geniuses uh, pod.com, uh, A-C-C-I, it's a play on Accidental, it's a pun, Geniuses pod.com. Mike uh, came up with the name, not me, by the way. And no. Mike Natola was the first podcast I did. I, he was number one, 200, 400, and he said he's going to come back for 600. Uh, what about they can, 500? What's that? 500's a big one. He's going he's gonna to shut you out at 500? I, I think we're just gonna do every two hundred. I think that's the pattern we're on. But uh, he's not um, that busy. I know what he's doing every day. He's not that busy. And and if and if you want Joshua to speak at your next study club meeting, go to AustinDentalSeminars.com. By the way, you know what a tip is for uh, blowing up your uh, your uh, your lecture uh, deal. Tell uh, me. Well, there's like two hundred and seventy eight study clubs uh, in the tripartite system that get speakers, <laughs> and it's all volunteer. So they have a meeting and they say, okay, we need three volunteers to pick the speaker. So three homies raise their hand and they're regretting it before their hand even gets to the top. And then or they go to- they didn't show up and so many volunteers Yeah, didn't. Yeah, rule number one, just never volunteer for anything. I, I always tell myself that every day. Why did I volunteer for that? And then they say to you, okay, you pick an endo speaker. Uh, they always say uh, clinical and they always say practice management because they want something for the staff. And then those guys go like, okay, I gotta pick an endo speaker. Who the hell speaks on endo? So they go to dental town and they uh -huh. and where the online courses are one hour and it's kind of like a it's your, your demo tape and okay. i had one guy put up a uh, an endo course for one hour and they he booked 76 invitational speakings so everybody that's putting up an online ce courses that that's the demo so um you you could Man. you should put up an online ce course i'm howard at dental town uh, the other howard tower goldstein so he's hogo at dental town but i i'd love to have a course by you i, I think you're love amazing you. Um, book them at your next seminar, AustinDentalSeminars.com. Uh, Joshua, thank you for all you do for dentistry. Love your column in dental economics. Um, thanks for taking over the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson and Jimmy Fallon it on with Justin Austin. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, man. Have all right. Have a great day.